Hello everybody, can you all hear me? If anybody can give me a yes, that would be fantastic. Good grief. Look at you all, brilliant. Right, uh, well my name is Neil, Neil Arnott, and I'm the host tonight for the Control Accounts, Journals and the Banking System webinar, part of the AAT Bookkeeping Week. And we're going to spend an hour or so looking at the various parts of this um, paper at level two. Um, it would be a good idea if you've got pen and paper and calculator with you to start with. Um, we're going to ask you to do a few questions. And so if you can have a pen and paper and a calculator, that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, and I'd also at this stage just like to introduce Jeff Grimston, who you won't be able to see because he's not with me. But he is my colleague at Premier Training, and Jeff is going to be answering any questions that you might be typing in. Um, obviously, whilst I'm doing the webinar, I might not have a chance to answer all the questions that you might have. So Jeff is going to step in and answer any of those questions that you've got. Or try to, at least. Okay, so if everybody's ready, we can make a start. Um, I've already introduced myself. My name's Neil. And if there is anything that crops up tonight that you're not 100% um, certain about after the webinar, by all means get in touch with us and we'll be more than happy to try and clarify the situation for you. And I'm going to try and look at three key things this evening. Obviously in an hour we haven't got time to go through the entire syllabus for um, this unit, but there are three key areas which I want to have a look at. And these are areas which students typically find um, perhaps the most challenging in the exam. And the first of these is, is question two in the exam and it's, it's the payroll question and in particular it's to have a look at the wages control account and how that works and we'll see in a minute why students do find that a little bit tricky at times. The second area we'll have a look at is what constitutes question five in the exam and that is balancing the trial balance and preparing journals to correct errors. And then finally, we'll finish off with question 10, which is to reconcile either the sales ledger control account or the purchase ledger control account. And hopefully by tackling these three um, key areas, it'll stand you in better stead when it comes to taking the exam. Um, is there anybody doing the exam in the next week or so? Have we got anybody online that's, that's sort of all geared up and ready to go in the next few days? I see multiple attendees are typing. Oh, tomorrow. Good luck, sally -Ann. Next Wednesday, next Friday. Crikey. Right. Oh, Shelley's already done the exam. Okay, let's have a look then. So why have I picked those three areas in particular? Well, this is feedback from the examiner. Um, the, the, the person who actually writes the exam and these um, charts are available on the AAT website in the study support section and they're incredibly useful. I don't know whether everybody's seen these before, um, they're available for every unit but they're incredibly, incredibly useful for you as part of your revision. Um, the website address at the bottom in red is, is where you can find this one but if you just go through the AAT study support section you should be able to find it. And what this graph shows is for each of the 12 tasks in this exam, how students around the country typically do. And this is for a six month period, it's the most recent um, data that we've got. Um, and we can see the dark green basically means that students have exceeded it. So task one, look at that, 96, 97% of students exceed task one. The three tasks that we're going to focus on tonight, task two, task 5 and task 10, we can see those are the three that students around the country typically have most problems with. Um, task 2, about 72% of students either meet or exceed that particular task. Task 5, it's only around 60% and task 10, it's about 68%. So these are the three key tasks in this um, exam which students are going to find the most difficult and so therefore I think it's worthwhile that we focus on these tonight. So we'll start by having a look at a typical question from task two. Uh, this is a, a payroll or wages control account question. And it causes problems for students, I think, for a number of reasons. Firstly, because 
lots of accountancy students um, at this stage in their careers, particularly when they're just starting level two, don't deal with payroll in their job. So it's a totally new, um, quite alien um, discipline and technique that they're dealing with. Secondly, a lot of um, organisations now, of course, have automated payroll functions. Everything is computerised through something like Sage Payroll. And so, therefore, students don't really get to understand the, um, the intricacies of how to construct a manual payroll um, question or answer. And students in particular get a little bit confused about the role of the wages control account, which is a key part of tackling any payroll question, particularly in task two. What the examiner says, the examiner says that students in this task will need to prepare journal entries to record some of the payroll entries needed through the general ledger. And it's challenging for some students. Common errors include reversal of entries. So that's getting the debits and credits the wrong way around selecting the incorrect accounts or calculating the wrong amounts. And this is where we can now start to see how a wages control account is necessary. A wages control account is just a temporary account. It's, it's, a, it's an account that's set up at the time that the um, payroll is being um, calculated for the organisation. And of course, that could be on a weekly basis, a monthly basis. Um, so the, the payroll, um, Accountant will set up a wages control account, basically to, to keep everything nice and tidy and keep everything together. And it can be difficult, particularly I used to work in, a, in a, an engineering company and you would have lots and lots of different grades of staff, each of them earning different rates of pay. You would have to collect the hours that they'd worked, uh, perhaps through a timesheet or a clocking system. There would be staff deductions, there'd be absences, there'd be illnesses, there'd be holidays and so on. Um, we also have a very, very complicated bonus scheme. So payroll in itself is not all that straightforward, but at level two, um, hopefully I can show you it's not too complicated. We have to remember that the starting point for payroll is going to be that we collect the timesheets, um, whether that's electronically or, or uh, manual, from each of the different departments in the organization. Without the timesheets, we won't know how many hours each individual member of staff has worked and therefore what their gross pay is going to be. Once we've collected that data on the timesheets, though, we need to do two things with it. We need to firstly be able to charge the payroll cost to the relevant department, whether it's manufacturing, administration, sales, HR, whatever it happens to be. And the second part of the payroll equation, if you like, is then that we need to calculate how much we need to actually pay to the staff. That's the net pay. How much we're going to need to pay um, to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, HMRC, for things like um, pay as you earn, income tax, uh, for national insurance contributions, um, student loans, for example, and also to, for example, a pension provider um, where the employer uh, makes pension contributions, as indeed do individual employees. Now this makes it seem very complicated to start with, but it, it's not quite as complicated as it sounds. So we're going to look at what we're going to put into the wages control account. And this very often is one of the hardest things for students to get right. They forget or don't understand which side of the wages control account deals with which aspect. On the credit side, we're going to record the total cost to the employer of employing the workforce for that period of time, whether that's a week or a month. Um, now, looking at Mohammed's question there um, and Jeff's response, salary, of course, is an income for the individual, but it's an expense to the employer. And so the employer has to treat as an expense the gross wages, but also the additional costs of employing staff, which are the employer's national insurance contributions, and also any contributions made by the employer to a pension company on behalf of the employees. Now, gross wages is not the same as the actual amount that the employee will receive. The gross wages, if, if you like, is the total amount of wages. On the debit side, we, we look at that total cost for the employer and we work out who is that money actually going to go to. 
Now, the, the vast chunk of it will indeed go to the employees. It will be the net wages. But not all of it goes to the employees, and that's because out of those gross wages, the employee also has to pay uh, things like pay as you earn, income tax, employees, national insurance contributions, uh, student loans, um, pension contributions. The employer's additional costs, the employer's national insurance contributions and the pension will also have to be paid over to HMRC or to the pension company as it uh, as, as is appropriate. So on the debit side, we're going to show where those payroll costs that the employer has incurred will actually go to. And it will generally go to three, three places, either the employees, HMRC, or the pension company. Everybody understand this? Okay, Sophie, just to answer that one then, if HMRC is a liability, and that's increasing, should it be on the credit side, it will absolutely be on the credit side of the HMRC liability account. Remember, this is the wages control account, and it's just a temporary place to put things. It allows us to jiggle the figures around to make sure we're getting everything right in the first instance. Okay, so for now, just work with this. On the credit side, we're going to put the gross wages plus any additional employer costs. And on the debit side, we're going to show where those payroll costs actually go to. Let's have a look at this then. We've got a company here, Gary Baldy Limited. I see one or two people just mentioning VAT. VAT is nothing to do with payroll at all. Okay, so VAT won't crop up in this question whatsoever. It does crop up elsewhere, obviously. Um, but just be aware at this point, VAT at the moment isn't, well, VAT will never be part of a payroll question. Okay, so Gary Baldy has following payroll data for, for May. And we've got things like gross pay. And the net pay. Now, net pay is going to be part of gross pay. That's not an additional cost. We've got pay as you earn. Again, that's part of gross pay. We've got national insurance contributions, which are paid um, firstly by the employee out of their gross pay, but then the additional employer's national insurance contributions as well. And we've got the pension contributions, both on behalf of the employee, so that's what the employee pays, and the employer. If we take those figures, we can see that the figures that are now on the left-hand side, the, the gross pay, the national employers, sorry, the employers' national insurance contributions and the employers' pension contributions, those figures on the, the, in, in black, they represent the costs to the employer and they will be what goes on the credit side of the wages control account. The figures in green, which is net pay, pay as you earn, employees' national insurance contribution, employees' pension contribution. If we add those figures up, we can see that it comes back to the gross pay. Everybody see that? So 28,458,6286 for the PAYE, 3275 for the employees' national insurance contribution, 1800 for the employees' pension contribution, come to 39819. And that's the gross pay which is which constitutes what is paid to the employees plus the bits that the employee has had to pay out of that the deductions if you like and the two figures in red the 3640 and the 2400 those are the additional costs to the employer over and above over and above the gross pay if everybody can understand that, we can now start to look at how that's going to go into the wages control account and see how that balances itself out. So step one will be to record the wages expense. Now wages is an expense to the employer, as we've seen. And therefore in the wages expense account, that will go on the debit side. Okay, Expenses are always a debit. The wages expense is made up of the gross wages, the employer's national insurance contribution and the employer pension cost, uh, employer pension contribution, sorry. So they will go on the credit side of the wages control account. All okay with that? So they'll go on the debit side of the wages expense account, and that's the the expense to the employer. That's what it's cost the employer to to employ the staff 
for this period of time. Into our temporary wages control account they will go on the credit side. Now on the wages control account we can show where those costs are going to go to. Okay, so the total cost to the employer, remember, is 39819 plus 3640 plus 2400. Who gets that money that it's cost the employer? Well, 28,458 of it, that was the net pay figure, that's going to go to the employees. It comes out of the bank and goes to the employees. That's what the employees take home in their pay packet. The 13,201 to Her Majesty's Revenue and Custom, that's made up of the employees' national insurance contributions, the employers' national insurance contributions, and the pay as you earn, the income tax. And 4,200 of it will be owed to the pension contribution, uh, pension company rather, for the employer's pension contributions and the employee's pension contributions. So we can see that that total cost to the um, employer, that total cost is being shared out between the people it's going to go to. It's either going to go to the employees, in which case it comes out of the bank, it's going to go to a Majesty's Revenue and Customs for pension, uh, sorry, for um, income tax, pay as you earn, and for national insurance. Or it's going to go to the pension company ultimately for pension contributions. And now I can't remember who it was, Sophie, I think it was, um, wanted it to be a credit for HMRC and we can see that it is because on the opposite side here's the bank 28,458 that's going to credit the bank when the money is paid to the, the employees that money is going to come straight out of the bank HMRC won't need paying until some point in, in the following month so therefore it's set up as a liability on the credit side of HMRC for £13,201 and at some point in the next month we will pay that and the money will come out of the bank, credit the bank and debit HMRC to clear the uh, liability. But at the moment, at the end of the, the payroll period, there's a liability to, wages, uh, to HMRC there for 13201 And there's also a liability to the pension company, which presumably will be paid somewhere in the next few weeks, for £4,200 coming out of wages control again. Sophie, thank you. That makes perfect sense. I love that kind of comment. Everybody else okay with that one? It, it, it may not be obvious at this point, but if you take this video and look at it a couple of times and do some practice questions, hopefully it will start to make sense that there is a technique involved and a routine involved. And if you follow that, you, you really, really won't go far wrong with this question. And we can see if we do that, that the wages control account, which I said earlier was a temporary account, has now cleared. We've, we've credited the gross cost to the employer, £45,859. And we've debited where that £45,859 is going to. The wages control account is then cleared. And at the start of the next payroll period, it would have a zero balance on it. And again, we would go through the same process. OK, so this is a question I would like you guys to have a go at then. Um, you can see the poll there. Bob Unlimited has the following payroll data for June 2016. What I would like to know, first of all, is what is the total wages expense for the month? What is the cost to the employer of employing staff for that period of time for June 2016. Have a go at your answer. I'll give you a few minutes, few um, a minute or two to work it out and start popping your votes in.
instead of popping it in the chat, everybody, if you actually you should be able to just click on the box up at the top and it should work in the pool then. And then at least we can, we can see what everybody's going for. Okay, let's broadcast the results then. Let's have a look, see how we're doing. And we can see that 94% of you reckoned it was D, £86,004. It might even have been more of you because some of you were popping it into the chat box. Let's have a look at the correct answer. In a second. Here we are. So the correct answer, well done everybody. Um, the correct answer, the total wages expense for the month is the gross pay, 7658, plus the employer's national insurance contributions, plus the employer's pension contributions, which is a total of £86,004. That's brilliant. Well done. Good. Well. Okay, so with the same figures, what would be the credit entries in the wages control account? We can either debit net pay of 46285, debit HMRC 28669 and debit the pension company 11050, or we can credit those or we've got the four options to have a look at. So have a look and see what you come up with. Just make sure you scroll down the screen to see the fourth option, because option D is, is hiding there. Hi Kelly, I, I'm pleased you got it right. PAYE is included as employee cost, but it's part of gross wages. Do you think the gross wages is the top line of what you would see on a pay slip, but the net wages is once all the deductions have been taken off, and PAYE is one of those deductions that gets taken off. So it comes out of, it's not the employer that pays it, it's the employee, and it comes out of their top line gross wages. Okay, just another 10 seconds on that one then. We're getting quite a lot of responses through. Can we broadcast the results, James, please? And just short of 80% of you going for um, option D. So if we can end that poll, James, brilliant. And what we should be doing is we should be crediting gross pay, 70,658, crediting employer's national insurance contributions, 9246, and crediting the employer pension, 6,100. Well done, 83% of you. That's brilliant. Fantastic. No surprises now then as to what question three is going to be. What will be the debit entries? And again, we've got some options up there in the poll box. Four options. Make sure you scroll right down to the bottom. What will be the debit entries in the wages control account?
10 more seconds on that one. Option A seems to be by far the most popular. A few more seconds and then we'll end this poll and move on. Okay, thanks James. Oh, Kirill, 100% you bet your house. Confident. Well, 95% of you are going for option A. And we should indeed be debiting the net pay 46,285. <laughs> Just seen John's comment there. Um, debit net pay 46,285. That's going to go to the employees. The HMRC will be owed 28,669. And that will go onto the debit side of the wages control account, and the 11,050 go to the pension company. And that then balances those two accounts. Um, oh, sorry, that balances the two sides of the wages control account back to zero. Fantastic. That's really, really good, everybody. Well done. If anybody's got any questions about payroll and task two, um, by all means, post them into the comments box. Jeff will try and answer them as best he can. Um, and if there's anything that we can't answer, through the webinar, then we'll try and get back to you if we possibly can do. But I'd like to now move on to the next question. This is question five in the exam. And again, this is actually the one with the lowest pass rate amongst students. Only 60% of students um, either exceed or meet this in the exams. The task requires students to identify the entry needed to balance the trial balance and to record journal entries to correct an error and clear the suspense account. Proves challenging for some students and again common errors, reversal of entries, so getting the debits and credits the wrong way around and using incorrect account names and producing journals that don't balance. Some students don't read the task data carefully, and that's a, a common issue in all AAT exams, to be honest, right up to level four. Um, the number of times that we have students who know what they're doing, but don't read the question properly. So just take the time to read it. Okay, a lot of students get concerned about the suspense account. Um, I always describe the suspense account as being like that cupboard at the bottom of the stairs. When the in-laws or some friends are coming round and you think, I've only got five minutes to tidy up. Where am I going to put everything? You shove it in the cupboard at the bottom of the stairs. Okay. As we can see in the picture, somebody's got some friends coming around very quickly. That's what we do with the trial balance. If the trial balance doesn't balance and we don't know why, we shove the error into the understairs cupboard, into the suspense account. That way we can make the trial balance balance and we can carry on with our work. But of course, you do eventually have to tidy the cupboard out. You do eventually have to clear the suspense account out by the end of the period. But it's a temporary measure to allow you to move on with your work. OK. So we've got a question here. Button Limited has extracted a trial balance, which doesn't balance. The total of the debit side is 420956. The total on the credit side is 420976. What entry would be needed in the suspense account to now balance the trial balance? This is a typical starting question in this in this type of exam. Uh, James, is this a is this a poll question or is this just a, a, a work through it question? Apologies. No poll for this, so that's absolutely fine. Okay, so we can work through it. The total of the debit side is four two zero nine five six. The total on the credit side is 420976. We're getting some answers coming through of £20 debit. And that's exactly what it is. That's going to balance that up. Mohammed, can you hear me? Everybody else seems to be okay. Okay, so that's going to go into the suspense account and it'll sit in the suspense account until we eventually get around to clearing it when we know what caused the error in the first place. So let's have a look at some of the things which could cause an error which would appear as a suspense account entry. Okay, So we're looking for things where the debits and the credits in the original entry don't balance for some reason. 
Now that could be a calculation error. Maybe we've added up the columns of the trial balance incorrectly to start with. That's one possibility. So we've actually added up the two columns incorrectly. It could be when we've been casting the day books, adding up the, the total columns of the day books, such as the sales day book, the purchase day book, or the returns day books, or the cash book, that um, we've made an error at that point. And that, in an exam question, that's, that's probably the most common way it's, um, it comes through. Maybe we've balanced off the accounts incorrectly. Um, quite commonly, we've made a transposition error. That's where we get two figures in a number the wrong way around. Um, so instead of putting 45, we put 54. And another common type of error is where we only made one entry into the account. So in other words, we put a debit, but no corresponding credit entry. And that's going to create an imbalance. There's lots of other types of errors, um, which I'm sure people are aware of, which wouldn't show up in a trial balance. They wouldn't cause the trial balance not to balance, and therefore they wouldn't need a suspense account. But these are the typical ones that will cause um, an imbalance in the trial balance and therefore create a suspense account. Okay, so here's a question, and this is a continuation of um, the sorts of questions that we get in the um, exam. And we can see here that there's been an error in casting in the cash book. And the error is in the VAT column, um, because £146 VAT on the sales to Senna and £40 VAT on the sales to Burger Limited shouldn't come to £206. It should, of course, come to £186. So we've got a £20 error, and that ties back to the original £20 that we had there. Okay. Now, I think what causes problems for a number of students is, is, is two things. First of all, they don't always read that question carefully and see that that £146 there plus the £40 should not come to 206 it comes to 186 And And some students miss that, and it's there in the question. It's there for you to see. Um, and that's one area in which students have problems with this. Because we've made that error, we will have posted £206 into the credit side of the VAT account instead of £186. Helen, how do you know where to go looking to trace back the error? That's experience, probably. In the AAT exam, it will usually give you some guidance as to where it is. They'll give you a cash book like this and will generally tell you which column it's in. Um, if they don't, you're looking for a fairly obvious error. Okay. In the real world, it's much harder, of course. Can I just check that everybody else can hear me? I've had two people say they can't hear me. That's good. Thank you very much. That, 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 it's not at my end, then. We've obviously got a problem somewhere um, with a couple of students. That's brilliant. Okay. So, what are we going to do with this? Well, the question will typically ask you to do two things. Firstly, to record the journal entry which is needed in the general ledger to remove the incorrect entry. Now, the incorrect entry, remember, was £206 on the credit side. The credit side of the VAT account would have been credited with £206, which was wrong. So, the first thing we're going to do is take that £206 credit out and then the second part of the task, record the journal entry needed in the general ledger to record the correct entry that should have been made. So to do that, we would need to debit £206. So that's, that's the opposite of the thing that was wrong. We had originally credited £206 to the VAT account, so to remove it, we need to debit it. And then we put the correct amount in, that's £186, on the credit side, which is the correct journal. That's exactly what should have happened the first time round. Osana, that's it. Absolutely got it there. We've still got, at this point, a suspense account. And so the third thing we need to do is to remove the balance on the suspense account. And we'll do that. By crediting the suspense account with £20. Remember when we first set the suspense account up, it had a debit balance of £20. 
So by crediting it with £20, that removes the suspense account balance and clears it back to zero. And if we just flip back a slide there, if this works, we can see that those three journals together balance off against each other. We've got a debit for 206, a credit for 186, and another credit on the suspense account for 20. So they clear each other off. The double entry has worked. We've cleared the suspense account out, and we've got the correct amount in the VAT account. I'm not sure I'd fit so for Jeff might. He's only little, but I'm not sure I would. Now, some of you might have spotted there. Oh, there we go. That there is an easier way of doing this. In fact, all you needed to do was debit VAT by £20 and credit the suspense account with £20. That's all that needs to be done. And in the real world, that is probably what would happen. OK, if you see that, that's that's a really good sign. We can we can see why that is, because I'll go back a couple of slides. Hopefully. There we are. We can see that the first two entries we made, one was to debit VAT with 206 and the other was to credit VAT with 186. That's a £20 debit on the VAT account net. And the £20 to the suspense account on the credit side. So as I say, in the real world, we could correct it in one journal. We could simply debit VAT, credit suspense account. And I think this is where some students also go wrong because in the AT exams, in, in this unit in particular, they will generally ask you to remove the original entry first, then put the correct entry in. And that doesn't allow you to make this sort of shortcut approach to it, if you like. Why do AAT make you do that? That's a really good question, Elaine. AAT might be able to answer that one. Um, I suspect it's simply a, a way of testing that you understand the two-step approach to it, that you're, you're identifying an error to start with, then once you've identified the error, you're removing it, then you're putting the correct journal in. Okay? As I say, in the real world, you will probably take shortcuts. Jason, yeah, absolutely. In, in, this, in this question, those are the three journal entries that would be needed. Once you get to level three, um, you will start yourself finding that you can take these shortcuts a little bit. Um, as Jeff says, it gives you nice, neat matching sets of figures. OK, um, so for now, make sure you do understand how to do it this way, not just the shortcut way. I am so impressed with my timing at the moment. I'm supposed to be doing 20 minutes on each of these sessions and we've got 22 minutes left to fit the last one in. So fingers crossed we're on track. This is brilliant. OK, again, any issues with that question, anything you're not sure about, stick it in the chat box. Um, Jeff will do his best to answer it. If I spot it, I'll, I'll have a go at answering it as well. If not, we will get back to you if we possibly can do. Okay, time for a very quick drink. And it is only water. Uh, right, third question. <laughs> Cheers, John. Same to you. Third question. Reconciling the sales ledger control account or purchase ledger control account. Um, this is task 10 in the exam. And again, only about two-thirds of students actually meet or exceed this, this particular task. And the examiner says that the um, main problems for students, again, it provides challenge for students, reversal of entries, getting debit credits the wrong way around. And let's face it, guys, you've not been studying double entry for too long, so it's not surprising that you struggle a little bit at this stage with debits and credits and getting them the right way around. That is perfectly normal. All students do it. Students should consider the double entry carefully when attempting this task and pinpoint an entry they're confident is correct. So if you're confident that sales should be credited to the sales account, then everything else follows as a, as a mirror image. <laughs> uh, v and T, William, not G and T. I can't stand gin, I'm afraid, but uh, vodka and tonic will do me nicely. OK, anyway, that's for later on tonight. What goes where? You really do, by by the time you get to this um, this unit, you do need to be confident with what a purchase ledger control account and a sales ledger control account really mean. Okay, 
So we'll start by looking at the sales ledger control account and the purchase ledger control account will, will follow from that. Sales ledger control account is the total amount of money that is owed to us by our credit customers. Okay? So it's the total amount that we are owed by our customers. And because we're owed it, it's an asset. It's, it's one step removed from having cash in the bank. Absolutely surely, it's an asset. Therefore, it's got a debit balance. Now, if you remember one side of this, the, the, the other half kind of follows. The sales ledger control account will have a debit balance because we're owed money by our, our customers. So anything which increases the amount of money we are owed by our customers will go on the debit side. Anything which decreases it will go onto the credit side. So there's a sales ledger control account. The balance brought forward will always be on the debit side. And any credit sales that we have made during the period, which we'll get from the sales day book, will also go onto the debit side because that will increase the amount we're owed by our customers. Okay, if we sell something to a customer and they haven't paid us for it yet, it's going to go on the debit side of the sales ledger control account. On the credit side, go anything that reduces the amount owed. So any receipts we've had from our customers, which will obviously show up in the cash book, um, so those receipts will reduce the amount that we're owed by customers and goes on the credit side. Any discounts that we've allowed to our customers. If we are owed £100 but we allow somebody a £5 discount, that discount allowed reduces the amount we're owed from £100 down to £95. So it's going to go on the credit side. Any sales returns, any goods that have been bought by customers but since returned to us because they're faulty, for example, and any bad debts, any irrecoverable debts, which we um, have had to write off because a particular customer has gone bankrupt, has left the country, has died, whatever's happened. If once we write that debt off and we accept that we're not going to be receiving it in the future, it's called an irrecoverable debt or a bad debt, and that is going to go on the credit side of the sales ledger control account. So everybody just take 20 seconds just to have a look at that and be happy with why those particular entries go on each side, the debits and the credits. Bounce checks, absolutely, Elaine, there's another one. Well, discounts received, surely, they're going to come, if you think about what a discount received is, a discount received is something we receive from one of our suppliers. So that's going to come through the purchase control account, not the sales ledger control account. Sophie, credit anything that lowers, it's not so much anything that lowers sales, it's anything that lowers the amount we're owed by our customers. Thank you, Jeff. It's not sales, it's the amount owed to us by our customers. Now, that should say we can have a look at the purchase ledger control account. Sorry, we've got that missing there. We can look at the purchase ledger control account. This is going to be the mirror image of it. The purchase ledger control account shows what we owe to our um, suppliers. Because we owe it, it's a liability, and therefore it will always have a credit balance. Anything which increases the amount we owe to our suppliers will go on the credit side, and anything which decreases it will go on the debit side. So it's the exact mirror image of the sales ledger control account in the purchase ledger control account. So on the credit side will be the balance brought forward, the total amount we owe to our suppliers. And that will be increased by any additional credit purchases that we've made through the course of the, the period of time we're looking at. Onto the debit side will go any payments that we've made to our suppliers. So if we've paid any invoices off, we've, we've um, made payments through the cash book or through the bank to our suppliers in, in, in regards to um, invoices from previous pe periods, that's going to go onto the debit side of the purchase ledger control account because it reduces the amount that we um, that we actually owe to our suppliers. There we go, there's discounts received surely, so they're going to go on the debit side of the purchase ledger control account because it reduces how much we owe to our customer, uh, to our suppliers rather, not customers. Any purchase returns that we've made, 
So if we've bought things, thank you Veronica, you're just ahead of the game there. Purchase returns that we've made. We've bought something from a supplier. And now we're going to send it back to the supplier because it's faulty. We're going to get a credit note from them. We're not going to owe them for it any longer. And therefore it's going to go onto the debit side. It's the opposite of a purchasing effect. And I think at this stage it's just worth just clarifying for you the difference between the sales ledger control account, the sales account, and the sales ledger account. Because again, quite a few students do struggle with these three different accounts and get a bit mixed up between them, uh, which is quite normal at, at, at starting out at level two. So the one we've been looking at there is the sales ledger control account. That's an account in the general ledger. It's a, it's a, it's a T account in the general ledger, which shows our total debtors in effect, the amount we're owed um, by our credit customers, people who owe us money. The sales account is something entirely different. That's a separate account in the general ledger. It's an income account. It shows the income we've made from selling goods to our customers. Net of VAT, okay, so it's always the net figure that's shown. And some companies just keep one sales account. Some companies will keep separate accounts for credit sales, cash sales. Um, if anybody has done the computerized accounting unit by now, and I know lots of you won't have done, but if anybody has worked with Sage, you'll know that there's lots and lots of different sales accounts in Sage you can have. You could have sales of different types of product or different types of service. They're all sales accounts. They're all income accounts. They all show the money we have earned, not necessarily received, but earned, from selling goods and services. They will always have a credit balance because it's an income account. And finally, the sales ledger is a separate book. It's, it's outside the, the, the general ledger, the nominal ledger completely. And all it is is a simple record of every single cre credit customer that we have. And we record what that credit customer owes to us. And every time they pay us something, every time we allow them a discount, in other words, it mirrors exactly what you put into the sales ledger control account on the same side. Okay, so if a customer buys something from us, that's going to increase the amount they owe us. We would put it on the debit side of the sales ledger control account. It would also go on the debit side of their individual account, Mr. Smith, ABC Limited, whatever it happens to be. Okay, so keep those three separate accounts quite separate in your mind as to what they are sales ledger control account is what we're owed sales account is what we've sold and the sales ledger is a separate record for every individual credit customer that we've got the same is true for purchase ledger of course as well it's, it's the opposite way around so the sales ledger control account will always have a debit balance the sales account will always have a credit balance and the sales ledger each individual account within the sales ledger will generally have a debit balance so very occasionally you'll get one that's got a credit balance if something's gone wrong they've maybe sent us some goods back or something like that but generally you'd expect them to have a debit balance and as we said the, the same is tr true for the purchase ledger control account the purchases account and the purchase ledger Now, it should be, if the double entry works, it should be that every single um, balance on the per sales ledger, every individual customer's account in the sales ledger, if you like, the balance on those accounts should all add up to be the same as the balance on the sales ledger control account. And if you're using something like Sage, that is inevitable. That has to happen because of the way the computer program works. But with manual accounting, it's possible, again, that we make errors. Um, we forget to put an account in, we transpose the figures or whatever it is. So this task often asks you to reconcile the ledger accounts in the sales ledger with the balance on the sales ledger control account in the nominal ledger. Or it may be the purchase ledger, purchase ledger control account. Okay. So here we are. We've got a, we've got a question coming up for you to have a go at here. At the beginning of May, 
the following balances are in the sales ledger. So these are individual accounts for individual customers that we've got. We've got six different customers there. And there are six different um, account balances. They all owe us different amounts. And the question is, what should the balance be on the sales ledger control account for it to reconcile, for it to match the total of the balances in the sales ledger? So we've got four options there in the, in the poll box. Um, off you go. Okay, okay, well, it's, it's not as hard a question as it perhaps looks. All you need to do is work out what the total of the um, individual figures, of, sorry, the individual accounts would be. We've got six customers there, so Paris Limited with a debit balance of 120989. They owe us £1,209.89. Helena Troy owes us £4,238.96, and so on. Just watch out for Archie Meads, though. He's got a credit balance. Lewis, that's it exactly. Add up all the debits and take off any credits. Got it spot on there. Okay, just 10 more seconds then. We appear to have a, a favourite here. Quite excited. It's a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest. With the United Kingdom being entry A by the looks of things, no vote. Okay, so clear winner there, clear favourite. We have uh, B twenty five thousand six hundred and sixty five pounds thirty eight pence. Let's just double check that. Neil will not now sing, Jeff. If you've ever heard me sing, you will know why. Can we end the poll, please, James? Sorry. We are having a minor technological... Oh, no, here we go. Brilliant. Right. And so the correct answer is 2566538. Well done, 57 of you. And I'm guessing here that the seven of you who went for 25910 probably didn't see that Archie Meads was a credit. Now, it would be quite unusual for a um, customer in the sales ledger to have a credit balance rather than a debit balance. The reason that might arise is perhaps where somebody has um, bought some goods from us and then paid for them and then has returned them and been issued with a credit note. That would leave a credit balance. Or perhaps, alternatively, there is just an error. We've added it up incorrectly somehow. So what we're saying here is we would expect the balance on the sales ledger control account to be £25,665.38. And if that's true, if that's what it is in the general ledger, if that's the figure that, that, that is there when we balance the sales ledger control account off, we've reconciled the sales ledger control account balance with the list of individual balances in the um, sales ledger. And of course, it could be a purchase ledger question as well, the, the, the other way around. 
Now, here's a, a, another question, a, a typical example from the bank, again, we've, from the exam rather, and again, we've got a poll for you. The total of balances in the purchase ledger totaled 87,283. So that's the amount of all the individual balances for all our individual suppliers this time, it's purchase, purchase ledger, all our individual, the amount we owe to them. But we've now discovered that an invoice for £340 has been omitted from a supplier's account. We've, we've not included it in that supplier's account. And another invoice for £49 was posted to the credit side of ABC Limited, and it should have gone to Abacus Limited. So we've, we've simply posted the invoice to the wrong account, the wrong, uh, the wrong supplier. We've now corrected those errors. We've put those things right. And what question is, what should the balance of the purchase ledger control account now be? Remember, this is purchase ledger control account. Okay, just a few more seconds then. C is clearly the winner on this one. Let's see if that's right in a moment. Brilliant. If we can broadcast that one then, James, please. Fantastic. So 85% of you um, thinking that it's C. Well spotted Afsana and John there. The There are two possible errors here, and this is a typical AAT, let's try and catch a student out question. The invoice that had, be, that had been omitted has now been entered correctly. So that is going to affect the total of balances. We've, we've added an extra £340 into that. The invoice for £49 that had been incorrectly entered into the um, credit side of ABC Limited has been taken out of there, put into Abacus, so it hasn't actually affected the total figure altogether. Okay, trick question, Helen, absolutely. Well done. So, the correct figure should be, should be, he says, there we go, the correct figure should be, Eighty-seven thousand six hundred and twenty-three, and it's on the purchase um, ledger control account we're looking at, so it's going to be a credit. So well done, those of you who got that. Again, it's another one of those where, as the examiner says, where do students go wrong? Often it's in reading the question. It's m not quite getting the grasp of what's in that question for you to answer. So just take double care with it. And at 1950, they are great at trick questions. At 1958, 1959, in fact, 1959, one minute to go on my deadline. If anybody's got any additional questions, please fire them away, um, stick them in. And what we've done here, we've just stuck some um, additional revision videos that you might find useful. Um, there's one on pearls, which is a way of remembering. Um, whether things are debit or credit. There's a little video on suspense accounts and there's one on correcting journals. So by all means, have a look at that. Um, if they're of any help, and then feel free to uh, to let us know that. And if you, if, if you think there's anything at all that you really want to um, 
go through in more detail or, or we've been a little bit rushed tonight because obviously we tried to cover three core tasks in 60 minutes um, but if there's anything you want to do fire away stick questions on and we'll try our very best thank you very much for the feedback um, Veronica, I wish I was in sunny West Africa with you. I'm in very rainy Scarborough at the moment on the northeast coast, and uh, I'm very jealous of you being in, in uh, West Africa. Um, and a big thank you as well to my um, gorgeous helper, Jeff, um, my beautiful assistant, um, for dealing with the comments as they've gone through. Good evening, Scarborough, yes. I do. I feel like I'm giving the votes for uh, the United Kingdom here. Plays out with the tune on the old one? I don't think so. And Jeff is awesome. You're absolutely right. Uh, Aruna, absolutely. Very quickly then. Um, the the amount that didn't affect the trial balance. Let me just flick back to you there. The one which didn't didn't affect the the, um, the, the balance on the purchase ledger control was the forty nine pound because it had already been entered into the purchase ledger just to the wrong account. So by taking it out of the incorrect account. Putting it into the correct account, it's not going to affect the total balance. I hope that, that makes sense. Um, so, again, it's been my first webinar for AAT. I've really enjoyed it, actually. I was a little bit nervous at the start, um, but it's, it's been great fun. I hope you found it useful. If you have got um, exams, good luck with them. I'm sure you'll do really, really well. All the very best.